Sure. Am I muted? No. Oh. Uh, hold on, sorry. Okay. So I will be talking about um, a specific um, enzyme in the shikimate pathway called shikimate kinase, and it's a possible drug target. So this is just a review of the shikimate pathway. Um, it's a seven-step uh, catabolic pathway um, that's found in like plants, fungi, and bacteria, and it leads to the synthesis of charisma, which is um, a molecule necessary to make aromatic um, amino acids. Um, and a the entire pathway is just such a good drug target because it's only found in like plants and like um, bacteria and like not animals pretty much. So then it would kill all the bacterial cells in your body without harming anything else in the host. Um, this is the specific step that I'm talking about today. It's the fifth step. Um, it's the shikimate is turned into um, shikimate three phosphate catalyzed by shikimate kinase. And basically what happens is uh, shikimate kinase just takes an AT, a phosphate group from ATP and just kind of puts it on um, shikimate to make, on shikimate to make shikimate three phosphate, which also generates ADP. Um, this is the structure of the enzyme. Um, here you can see this is ATP right here and also right here. Um, this is uh, shikimate right here and that's also shikimate. Um, right from the beginning you can see how the enzyme orients ATP to have the terminal phosphate group adjacent to shikimate so that it's like basically doing its job and putting it right in the position to perform the reaction. Um, on the left, you can see there's the aromatic side chain and there's also another um, aromatic side chain. I think it's like right there and right here. And, um, and what's interesting about it is it's sp2 hybridized and it's also a cation. Um, so you can see that there's like pi pi stacking um, interaction. So you can see where the pi bonds are like stacked flat to each other. Um, and then on the right, uh, you can see the phosphate group in orange right here, and then the my yeah the phosphate group right here, and then it has ionic bonds to the nitrogen here in blue, which is just interesting an interesting interaction because that is the terminal phosphate that is removed and then put on to the um, shikimate, and then also on the right you can see that this carboxylic acid right here um, is making two is making a um, ionic bond to this arginine right here. I know you can't really see it, it's like right here. Um, but yeah, so it's just lots of cool interactions within the enzyme. Um, this so, Liz, Lindsay, can I ask you a question real quick? Yeah. So uh, it looks like you edited, edited it out, but did your structure also have a magnesium similar to Beth's structures with uh, GDP and GTP? Do you remember that? No, I remember hearing about it, but when I went to, like, color by heteroatom, it never showed up. Okay, okay. Because um, it looks like you're, I mean, um, I would guess that I, I'm just bringing it up just to sort of um, show that oftentimes these nucleotide triphosphates or even diphosphates like ATP and GTP or their diphosphate forms, they usually have a magnesium ion associated with the phosphate groups um, um, just because it's a really favorable interaction and the concentration of magnesium in the cells is quite high. Um, so, uh, so I, and I just wanted to point out that that's one similarity between your enzyme and Beth's signaling protein is um, that they both bind nucleotides. Yours does transfer chemistry on it. Um, but it probably it probably has a magnesium somewhere in there too. Yeah. So I definitely remember reading about it. I just don't okay, know okay where it is on the chimera. Um, and then this is the physical structure of um, like it has like the exterior on it of the enzyme, and you can see that this like pocket is like perfect for the ATP, which is like always just like cool to see because like every time it's like what the heck. But then this is like I think this is a little piece of the. Um, 
shikimate. Um, but you can't like, I was looking for a place where you could like see the shikimate like on the exterior of the enzyme and you actually couldn't, I couldn't find it. So I'm guessing it like slides in there somehow and it's more like embedded in the protein. Okay, and so the next thing I'll be talking about is like measuring the effects of an inhibitor to like see if it is a good drug. Like say you have, you wanna test a um, potential inhibitor. Um, you have to be able to measure the amount of product formed. Um, so of course, effective inhibitors decrease the amount of product generally, like speaking. Um, and so one way to measure it is using enzyme assays, using absorbance. Um, so, in or, but in order for that to happen, the product has to have extensive conjugation. But many times, the product does not have extensive conjugation. Um, so what you can do is you can use an enzyme assay, and what the enzyme assay will do is it will convert either a product or the byproduct of an original reaction using other enzymes and like important molecules, like just other starting materials like ATP or NADH, which is what is used in my specific example. And it basically converts it into some molecule that is exhibits extensive conjugation, so it can be measured somewhere on the spectrum. And um, it can either be like, like the starting material has extensive conjugation and the product doesn't, or like it's just any sort of com um, combination of one part of the reaction having extensive conjugation and therefore measurable on the spectrum, and then another part of the reaction further down the line where there is no conjugation, so it can't be measured, and then the absorbance decreases. Mm. And then um, another um, way they do it is using a radioactive element, which they basically do the same thing, just with a radioactive element, and they then measure the radioactivity instead of the absorbance. Um, to measure uh, shikimate kinase's enzymatic activity, the specific assay used is PKLDH assay. Um, and so what happens is shikimate is converted into shikimate phosphate, um, and then in that same it generates ADP. And then um, ADP is then reconverted into ATP when it is combined with um, PEP and an enzyme PK, which then generates pyruvate. And then pyruvate is um, turned into lactate and is catalyzed by lactose dehydrogenase. And at the same time, NADH is um, converted into NAD+. And then NAD+, and NADH are what are measurable within this um, assay. So you can see like right about like 340, NAD+, has like barely any absorbance, and NADH um, has lots of absorbance. So the entire time the reaction is going on, they um, actually like monitor the reaction at 340 nanometers just to see the progression of the reaction and see if the inhibitor is working. Um, this is just more of the like structures. So you can see how this is phosphophenylpyruvate, which is actually interesting because it's also like more starting material from other reactions within the shikimate pathway. Um, but it's, so basically it's, that's catalyzed into pyruvate, which I don't know if you guys know is like a, which is the end product of glycolysis. And then you generate ATP, which then can, is also used to go back into the cycle of the shikimate, phos, shikimate to shikimate three phosphate. And then pyruvate is uh, turned into lactate with lactase dehydrogenase. And you can see how NADH goes to NAD plus. And then this right here is what they are measuring. But basically, like, the phosphate is pretty much just, like, cut off, and then this is just um, hydrolyzed. And NADH is, like, very similar to um, lithium borohydride. It's, like, basically the biological lithium borohydride. And then, yeah, so, like, basically, I was just going to talk more about how, like, one molecule of ADP and one molecule of phosphenylpyruvate is indicative that one reaction has occurred between shikimate and shikimate 3-phosphate. So as the reaction continues, you would expect to see the absorbance um, increase because NADH is what you are measuring. So if it's converted to NAD+, the absorbance will actually decrease. So if you, an, an effective inhibitor of this pathway would um, have a higher absorbance throughout the entire reaction. Mm. So 
that's basically it. That's right. Or a uh, or the slope the downward slope would be less. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Nice. Nice. Thank you, Lindsay. Does anybody have any questions for her before I begin my questions for her? So that's a nice example of an assay, right? Where it's, um, there are sort of these extra ingredients and activities in there so that you can link the enzyme you're interested in, the shikimate kinase enzyme, to something that's easy, easily measurable in like a spectrophotometer, right? Where you're changing a molecule or you're changing the amount of a molecule that either has absorbance or, or that has a that has um, an absorbance somewhere in the in the spectrum. I have a I have a quest I have a question. Okay. It's sort of for everybody, actually. So, Lindsay, would you mind um, showing? Um, a slide that has the reaction itself on it. Yeah. Hold on, sorry. While she's doing that, I got an interesting email yesterday from Janet asking what classes I could teach remotely, um, even if we're in person in the fall. Because um, not surprisingly, they're going to try and encourage people to minimize contact um, and sort of people getting together to reduce the risk of, um, you know, of course, the virus and everything. Okay, so this is this is my question for you. Because um, this this is something that we might do, right? We might uh, make this enzyme, and we can talk a little bit about how you would obtain the enzyme. We could talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then Lindsay talked about how you can measure this enzyme with, with by adding these other enzymes on there and then eventually measuring the conversion of NAD to NADH. Shikimate itself, you can just buy ATP, you can just buy um, so like, it probably wouldn't be that hard to like, kind of get this enzyme working. And I know how to do the pyruvate kinase lactate dehydrogenase assays. That's actually pretty easy too. Um, so my question for you is, you know, if that was true, like we could get shikimate kinase, we could buy shikimate, um, Actually, shikimate has a kind of nice chemical synthesis too that maybe we could look at later. But, and then you get ATP and you, you can measure the enzymes activity. And then like Lindsay said, if you add an inhibitor, just the rate of conversion to product in the presence of the inhibitor would be less, right? And as you, I think you're all getting, inhibitors work because they bind to the enzyme somewhere and then they affect the ability of the enzyme to do the reaction. So a simple way to do that would be to have the enzyme or to design a molecule that binds in the place of one of the substrates or one of the starting materials. So if you were going to design, a, let's just imagine for a second that you were going to design a molecule that would bind in the place of shikimate, but not do the reaction. Can you think about a way that you could do that? By altering maybe the structure of shikimate. Groups that are unable to be phosphorylated. So do you want to draw a candidate structure and hold it up to your screen? Or you could screen share and use the, the whiteboard the thing is, I, I would like somebody else to be embarrassed by that because it, it only has happens to me. Oh, it'll it'll be embarrassing, but I don't really know what groups can't be. That's the thing. So, 
something unreactive. Are you, are you, oh, I can do this. Do you want to draw some, do you want to draw it? <laughs> I don't really have an idea, that's the thing. <laughs> well, just keep saying what, let's talk about it a little bit, because this is kind of like, I don't know. I'm sorry, Lindsay, can you put it back up there? Yeah. Oh my gosh, sorry. My computer is not being cooperative today or any day. But maybe what, what generally are you talking about here, Beth? I was just saying that like, since if you want something that isn't able to do the reaction, you need like the side chains to be unable to be phosphorylated. But because the, they're alcohol groups, I have a feeling that that might mean something with the interactions within the protein itself because they're capable of hydrogen bonding. But that's true. So mm -hmm. you can't mess up with it too much, but I don't know something that's both unreactive with phosphate groups and also a hydrogen bond donor. Well, we could tell if it hydrogen bonds to the protein because we have the structure. I can't see it. Well, I mean, we can't, you can't tell it from this. Well, actually, we might be able to tell it from this figure. Actually, can we make this a little bit bigger? So, yeah. but let's just be explicit about what you're talking about here, Beth. Can you just explain in words what you're talking about? Like... Do you understand what I'm saying? So I think you're describing making a modification to shikimate, but yeah. what what exactly? Changing so, the alcohol groups to something that can't be phosphorylated because that's the whole purpose of the reaction. So if it can't have a phosphate tacked onto it, then... Then it'll just sit there and do nothing. Um, I have a question. Could it also yeah. um, be something that would like bind stronger to the nitrogen groups? I think that's what it is. Yeah, so um, you can see that like the carboxylic acid right here uh -huh. is like kind of binding with like its ionic bond. It's bound ionically to the nitrogens. Could you do something to make that interaction stronger so that it doesn't want to? Yeah, I mean, so that, yeah, that would be great would be to, you know, if um, sort of like I prompted you, if you're trying to find something that binds in the same pocket as shikimate, it's gonna have to take advantage of the surface of that pocket, right? So, and, and, and at least part, the, that back part of that pocket is definitely cationic. Um, yeah, so I, it's hard to imagine having a molecule that does not have an anion to interact with that part of the pocket. I think that's true. Yeah. No, but like, could you come up, like, is it possible, like, I don't, obviously we don't know if it's possible, but like, is it feasible to say that it could covalently bind to the nitrogen and then therefore wouldn't react or does it not really? Well, night, so if, so you're analogizing from um, Beth's case where, yeah. where her, her molecules are definitely make, gonna make a covalent bond to the protein. Um, making a covalent bond to arginine is difficult because, um, well, arginine is a cation, so it's certainly not nucleophilic because it's actually electron poor. Okay. Um, so you, this might be an, this might be an enzyme where you, that you can't do that. It would have to be just bound through non-covalent bonds. Um, but I think what you, you would want to pay attention to those arginines um, because whatever you put at that position is really going to have to be an anion, right? Because if you put, um, in order to have a favorable interaction with those two arginines, and actually can you use your mouse to just sort of illustrate what we're talking about here, the arginines, boom and boom. Yeah. That's it? Yeah. Yep. They're both, those are two cations that are touching shikimate. That's actually kind of bad news for drug design because 
if the talk gets too polar, um, it's uh, the easiest interaction to use to promote binding is actually nonpolar interactions. Um, so if the pot gets too polar, um, people oftentimes have a hard time doing it, which is actually why the GDP binding pocket of RAS has resisted all efforts for decades. It's too polar. You can't design a molecule other than GTP that binds it. So, um, so that can be a problem. Um, but it is pot. So, uh, so this might be a, a difficult pocket to make inhibitors of. And part of what I'm doing is next Lindsay's next paper d d describes some analogs of shikimate that are inhibitors. And I just want you to anticipate what you might see. You know what I mean? Um, but I think, um, yeah, the, the basic idea, and I, I would be surprised if no one made this molecule. Imagine you take that leftmost hydroxyl group. Can you circle that, Lindsay? Yeah. Um, the one that gets the phosphate, um, if you just delete it. Right. Or, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Circle slash that thing. Then that, um, if that molecule binds in the shikimate pocket, it will act as an inhibitor. It might be a sucky inhibitor, but it would bind but not do the reaction. So it would make the enzyme slower because it would essentially like confuse it, right? Um, and then you could start modifying the structure in other systematic ways to make, to make the affinity of your molecule for the pocket better, right? Which would make the molecule work at lower concentrations and, and so on. Um, so, um, do you see what I'm saying? So those are the types of molecules I think that are coming in um, Lindsay's next paper on sort of shikimate analogs that are inhibitors of this enzyme. The other thing that we should talk about, I was thinking about doing a couple days where I just tell you things. Would that be sort of refreshing and relaxing for all of you? Yeah, <laughs> you're nodding, sadly. Um, one thing that I could talk about would be how, how would you get, because I don't think any of you know this, how would you, how would you make shikimate kinase or RAS or any of these proteins? Like how, how do you do that, right? Um, what's the procedure to make an enzyme or any protein like in the lab? Um, do, you, do you need like the DNA of like that codes for the sequence of the amino acids? And then you need, yeah. you need, to, you yeah. need to transcribe it into RNA and then you need to have the ribosomes present to translate it into the protein. All of that is true. So what that what you're really describing is, yeah, you so see you need you need the gene um, that encodes for the protein you're interested in. Um, and then what you do is because there's all this machinery that has to get engaged to convert the DNA into the protein right through the RNA. Um, you just do it inside of an organism, right, that has all of that apparatus. So typically, you just use like E. coli is the easiest one if you can, if you can do that. Um, and if you may know that making bacterial proteins is easier because they don't have um, introns, right, that have to be cut out. Um, if you tried to make RAS, right, in a bacteria, you would have to... Um, you would have to um, take those introns out like on your own, um, which there are ways to do that, but um, it's easier to make bacterial proteins in bacteria because 
it's sort of like more ready to go. Um, so making shikimate kinase for all that reason would be good. So yeah, you would get the gene. And then if you put that gene into bacteria in a sort of a suitable format, um, the bacteria will make it for you. And then you can purify it from the bacteria. And this actually gets to your point, Emily, right? So this is how they're making all of those enzymes and the, the mutant versions of it. Um, so one at a time, they're making them pr probably in bacteria and purifying them and seeing how good they are at any biocatalytic reaction. 